All right, so I'm Natasha, I'm from the University of Michigan. I'm gonna talk about an experiment that I've worked on for the past six years, uh, and that's a measurement of the permanent electric dipole moment of xenon. Um, so first I'm gonna start at the very beginning. I wanna talk about the motivation uh, for this experiment, why we care about EDMs in general. And that starts with uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry. So we don't think matter-antimatter asymmetry is just an initial condition of the universe uh, because of inflation. So if, if, uh, if it was an initial condition, it would be washed out in inflation. If uh, all, the, all the processes that happened during inflation were uh, matter-antimatter symmetric. So what we need, we need, um, we need uh, to be able to dynamically create uh, a baryon asymmetry. And the conditions for that to happen are called the Sakharov conditions. Uh, so the first one is baryon, violation, baryon number violation, which is straightforward. To generate a baryon asymmetry, you need to violate baryon number. Uh, the second is a loss of thermal equilibrium, and you can think of it as if there's any process that uh, violates baryon number or it, it generates a, an asymmetry at thermal equilibrium, the inverse process is equally likely. So what you need is uh, uh, interactions that happen outside of thermal equilibrium. Uh, and then the last one is uh, C and CP violation. So C is charge conjugation, it's a symmetry between particles and antiparticles. So if you have a, a, a process with particles that uh, generates uh, baryon asymmetry, the uh, charge conjugate process with antiparticles will restore symmetry. Uh, and there's like a loophole here uh, where if you conserve parity, then if you have a uh, charge conjugate process, uh, it will restore baryon asymmetry. So what you really need is CP violation as well. Um, and that's what I want to focus on because currently in the standard model there's not enough CP violation to, to, um, to generate a baryon asymmetry, uh, so which is why we care about uh, beyond the standard model sources of CP violation. And electric dipole moments are a great uh, place to look for those uh, because of uh, electric dipole moment uh, if you measure an electric dipole moment, it is time reversal violating and therefore it is also CP violating. Okay, so on the next slide, I'm going to have a very complicated figure, but I want to uh, point out that this is just uh, possible uh, beyond the standard uh, model sources of CP violation and how they could end up in our experimentally observable systems like the uh, neutron electric dipole moment and atomic electric dipole moments. Um, and so these different experimentally observable systems are sensitive to different kinds of beyond the standard model CP violations. So for example, paramagnetic atoms are particularly sensitive to the electron uh, uh, EDM, which is why paramagnetic atom uh, atomic EDMs are used to constrain uh, the electron EDM. Uh, I care about the xenon EDM, which is a diamagnetic atom, which is uh, sensitive to um, hadronic CP violating parameters. Okay. So the previous xenon uh, EDM measurement was in 2001, uh, and it measured, uh, it had a sensitivity about 3 times 10 to the minus 27, uh, and that was using a dual species maser, uh, xenon and, and, and helium as a comagnetometer. Uh, there is a very recent measurement uh, that came out last week uh, from, uh, that's, a, that's a, also a new limit. Okay, um, the experiment that I work on is a hexa EDM experiment. Uh, it's uh, a xenon EDM measurement using a helium-3 comagnetometer. So uh, the way this measurement works is that we measure the precession frequency of xenon, and if there is an uh, uh, electric dipole moment, that precession frequency will shift in the presence of an applied electric field. Um, and helium, we expect this term to be very, very strongly suppressed, so we use helium as a way to uh, uh, monitor the magnetic field. So in the comagnetometer system, we take this weighted difference uh, of the frequencies where it's weighted by the ratio of the gyromagnetic ratios of each species, uh, and that is proportional to the EDM. Um, and uh, we, we polarize using uh, spin exchange optical pumping. Uh, we use uh, uh, squids to detect the precession uh, signal in a magnetically shielded room. Okay, so I don't think I need to describe spin exchange optical pumping to this crowd, you're all experts, but briefly we uh, polarize rubidium uh, and through spin exchange collisions we can polarize the xenon and helium. And we do this um, uh, simultaneously for both uh, xenon and helium. Um, and then we use a magnetically shielded room. This is the magnetically shielded room at the uh, Berlin, it's called the BMSR2. Um, and uh, it has a very stable magnetic field and very importantly, very um, small gradients and uh, it both spatially and uh, in time. 
Uh, and then we use squids with a noise level of about six femtotesla per hertz, um, and they're about five centimeters or from the middle of the measurement cell. So the three main parameters that we need uh, that, that determine our sensitivity to the EDM is the size of the electric field, uh, and that's uh, our, our signal to noise and the time that we can measure for. So the electric field is sort of limited by uh, high voltage breakdown. Uh, and so this is a, um, the passion curve that was measured for our helium xenon mixture by a master student, Ava Craigelo. Um, and what, what we found is that it's, it comes very close to the, um, the passion curve for helium. So at maximum, we can do about five kilovolts per centimeter. That's sort of our limitation on the electric field. Our signal to noise depends on uh, our squid sensitivity and how much we can polarize our helium and our xenon. Uh, but the most uh, important thing is how long we can uh, measure for it, because that's, uh, that's the, the biggest factor in, in, in determining our sensitivity. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly walk you through how we do our experiment. Uh, first, we polarize helium and xenon uh, in this polarizer room on the ground floor. This is all at the, uh, the PTB Berlin. So we polarize using spin exchange optical pumping in this pump cell uh, that's in an oven, and then we transfer the polarized gas to a valved EDM cell, which has um, electrodes that we can apply high voltage to. Then we detach the cell, put it inside this transport coil, which is around, I think, uh, around 100 microtesla. Um, and then we take this uh, transport coil up one floor to the BMSR2, uh, place it inside the room, take the cell out, place it underneath our squid doer. So this is what it looks like inside the room. Uh, we use two sets of coils. One is to apply our static magnetic field, which is around 2.6 microtesla. And then we use uh, another set of coils uh, in, the six, uh, in our 2017 run to apply a AC pulse uh, that's coherent with both species. That's our uh, pi over two pulse. Um, and then we just measure the signal from the, the spin precession um, with our squids. So this is what the cell looks like underneath the uh, squid doer. Uh, there's high voltage uh, applied here to one electrode and the other one is held at ground. Uh, this is our um, 3D printed holder for the cell, so we're in the same place every single time we do a measurement. Um, and then there's this uh, safety wafer, it's a grounded plate just to protect the squids in case of any high voltage discharge. Okay, how we uh, determine our frequency. So I'm gonna walk you through our analysis procedure. So this is what the, we get from the squid. Um, so we see just the spin precession signal. Uh, there's a squid uh, baseline drift. On the top here is uh, our electric field. This is the pattern that we apply our um, high voltage in, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit in a minute. Um, so the first step is to apply just a, a high pass filter to remove that drift. Uh, and then we cut up the data uh, based on our high voltage. Um, and then we uh, do a time domain fit of the signal. So uh, in the next plot, I've zoomed in a little bit so you can see the two um, species. Uh, uh, there's just two sine waves, and so we fit uh, just a sine cosine fit to each species. And from that uh, fit, we get the phase uh, um, per block. Um, and so we, uh, sorry, I, I skipped over this briefly. So these, these are our segments, and we further divide these into blocks. And then we get a phase for each block. And then we take a linear fit of that phase to get our frequency for each segment. So we get, uh, for, our, for this, we have, um, about 36 segments, that means I'll get 36 frequency measurements. Okay, uh, and once we have, uh, sorry, I, I skipped this, when we, when we get the phase, we correct the, apply the co-magnetometer correction to the phase and then do a linear fit. So this plot on the right just shows the, the different drifts that are uh, important in this experiment. So for the single species precession uh, frequencies, you can see there's this B0 drift that dominates um, at around 20 seconds or, or beyond 20 seconds. Once you do the co-magnetometer correction, uh, you can measure for a lot longer, and then there's another drift that's apparent um, at a couple hundred seconds. Uh, that's our co-magnetometer drift, and it's also the reason that we flip the high voltage so, we can, uh, so that we always are measuring a frequency in this area where we're white phase noise limited. Um, so we, we get our, our uh, co-magnetometer frequencies for each segment, uh, and then uh, we also blind these frequencies uh, before we do our analysis. 
Okay, to determine it, uh, uh, the EDM, so this is, uh, these are the 36 uh, frequencies that I have, the co-magnetometer frequencies. Uh, you can see that there's this uh, drift that's apparent across the course of the measurement. Uh, so what we do to, to um, mitigate this drift is that we uh, combine segments and sets of four using a plus minus minus. So this is the reason for this uh, pattern that we apply. Um, so this plus minus minus plus or minus plus plus minus removes any linear drift. And of course, this is not completely linear, so there's a small correction that we have to make. Uh, so once you do this, you get these frequent or these uh, yeah these frequencies, um, and these are our EDM frequencies that we then average to get our EDM uh, over all the measurements. Okay, so I want to talk about our systematic effects. So our co-magnetometer frequency is very um, sensitive to our magnetic field environment. So uh, there's a number of, of effects that can um, cause uh, a false EDM. So the co-magnetometer drift, uh, I showed a little bit, and I'll talk about that again later. Then there's the a leakage current, which is if there's a current that goes across the cell from one high voltage electrode to the other, that will go in a spiral pattern over the cell, and which means that it's high voltage dependent. The sign of this magnetic field that's created will change dependent on the high voltage um, sign. Uh, and then charging currents are currents from when you um, charge up your high voltage. So these are on the order of like one to 20 nano amps, and this could magnetize uh, any materials that uh, around the cell. So for example, our valve, our EDM cell has an O-ring in the valve. This is something that could get magnetized with the charging current. Um, then there's uh, electric field correlated cell motion. So the high voltage could cause the cell to move, especially because we have this uh, grounded electric plate right above. Uh, and if the uh, cell moves slightly, then you have a slightly different magnetic field environment, and so you could end up with a, uh, a false EDM just from being in a slightly different uh, environment. Uh, and then there's E squared effects, which is any effect that scales with the uh, magnitude of the electric field. So this is like the xenon chemical shift or any high voltage induced phase noise. Uh, e field uncertainty is determined from modeling of the uh, cell and the electrodes with the safety electrode. Um, this gives us an uncertainty of about 10%. Uh, it's very conservative. Um, and then the geometric phase is a calculation um, that's done uh, just uh, adopting the formalism for, for an EDM. Uh, this is a V cross E effect. Okay, so there are some frequency shifts that do not cause a false EDM. So there's a large shift from the uh, Earth's rotation and chemical shift. This is removed from a plus minus high voltage pattern. Uh, I mentioned that a linear co-magnetometer frequency drift can be removed by a plus, minus, minus, plus. Um, and then higher order drifts can result in a, a systematic error, which we account for. Okay, so we have this uh, model that we, we, we use to understand uh, what could cause a, um, uh, a false EDM. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's lots of things that can change. You can change your, your, your magnetic field environment uh, a little bit, and that will cause a false EDM. This is how it could cause a false EDM. So uh, the co-magnetometer frequency uh, depends on the magnet magnitude of B0 because of this coupling to the chemical shift. Uh, there's a different averaging of B0 from the different di diffusion of the two species and the presence of gradients. This can cause a uh, false EDM. Uh, there's um, the direction of B0. If the direction of B0 changes, for example, with, when the cell moves, um, that could cause um, a, a shift in this co-magnetometer frequency. Uh, and then there's this, this long co-magnetometer drift that I showed. Um, which is, uh, has been studied recently, and it's caused by um, residual longitudinal magnetization, for example, with an imperfect pi, pi over two pulse, um, and, and it's also uh, cell shape dependent. Okay, so to, to get a handle on our um, systematics, we did a series of auxiliary measurements. So we applied a current uh, and a wire across the cell uh, to mimic a leakage current, uh, and then we multiplied this frequency shift that we measured by our actual measured leakage currents during the measurement. Um, we did something similar for the charging current. We also did this uh, fake dipole test where we put a large dipole near the cell, uh, ran some current in a wire, and measured how much the uh, helium or how much the frequency changed. And you can see a very large effect in that case, where a dipole will change um, your co-magnetometer frequency. Um, and then we did uh, another test of our cell movement by um, just shining a laser on the electrode and measuring uh, its movement when you apply high voltage. Uh, these couple, the cell movement couples into the um, uh, cell of the, the earth rotation 
uh, to cause a false EDM. So our, in total, this is our, our systematic error for we had two runs, um, one in 2017 and 2018. This one has been, we finished analyzing 2018. We're still analyzing right now. Uh, and uh, our, our error is on the 20, 10 to the minus 28 level for our systematics. Uh, so our results from 2017 from one week of data collection, this is compared to the six months for the previous experiment. We reached a, a similar um, a systematic um, error or sy similar systematics to the previous experiment with one week. Uh, and that's this result over here. Um, you can see, you know, we use different cells, low and high pressure. Um, we uh, obviously changed B0 um, during the experiment as well. So we are currently analyzing a, uh, another run that was two and a half weeks in 2018. Um, and that uh, is very promising. It shows a, a limit that's about five times better than the current limit. Uh, and this is, this is numbers nonsense. It's blinded right now still, but uh, you can look forward to that soon. Um, so to conclude, we've, you know, we've done this, uh, uh, this experiment. We've gotten five times uh, improvement in sensitivity. I think with the signal to noise that we've already been able to achieve, um, with a 30-day measurement, um, of course, uh, we would have to handle our co-magnetometer drift enough to be able to measure for 800 seconds instead of around 400 seconds like we have been. But I think in 30 days, it's very reasonable for us to get a 3 times 10 to the minus 29 measurement. Um, and then I want to thank my collaboration and you for listening.